Hey everyone, uh, it's really nice joining you guys this morning. Uh, let's sing some songs and let's uh, praise God. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see you, holy, holy. Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy I want to see you I want to see you Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death Your perfect love is casting our feet Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back, I know you are near I will fear no For my God is with me If my God is with me Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh no, never let go Through the calm and through the storm Oh no, never let go Every eye and every low, no, never let go, never let go of me. I can see the light that is coming for the heart that holds on. A glorious light beyond all compare. And there'll be an end to these troubles. But until the day comes, we live to know you here on the earth. I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. If my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Shall I fear? Oh no, never 
never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, never let go every high and every low. No, never let go, never let go of me. Oh no. Let go every high and every low, no, never let go, never let go of me. Through the way. 
Good morning and richest blessings in Jesus to each and every one of you this morning. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the spiritual armor that God gives us for the battles we face as followers of Jesus. He's given us this armor in order for us to be victorious. We've also seen how important it is for us to pray consistently because it is prayer that empowers the armor that God has given us. You know, the the spiritual life is all about growth. And as we grow, we learn to use the armor that God has given us. And we're able to be victorious in all situations, in all the battles we face as followers of Jesus. Now, this morning, I want to look just one more time at this passage of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, right through to verse 20. And I want to try and tie all this together. So let's read a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in times of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for the Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador, so pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. You'll see that this passage starts with a command, and the command is simple, stand. As Paul starts talking about the armor that we need for our spiritual battles, he exhorts us to stand up under all circumstances, under attacks, under temptations. The command is simple, stand. Paul repeats it four times in this passage. We're told to stand, stand our ground, stand firm, and to stand. We're equipping ourselves to stand in this battle. And there are three important things that we need to understand about this command that Paul gives us to stand. The first thing is that it is a command to stand continually. This is not a command to get up and down, up and down, but to remain standing. The word that the Greek word that Paul uses here means to stand continually. Jesus uses the same word in Matthew 10:22. And it says that he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Paul's using the same tense here, which is implying that we are standing and we will continue to stand. This call is not a call just to stand some of the time, but it's a call. It's a command to dig our feet in and make a decision that nothing will move us. We're to stand continually. And this brings us to the next thing. We're not standing alone. We stand in God's strength. Verse 10 says, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Obeying the command to stand means we also need to understand where we get our strength from. We choose to stand, but the strength to stand comes from God. It's His power. When we face trials and temptations of life, we're not going to be able to stand in our own strength. We can stand in the strength of God. In 2 Corinthians 2 verse 21, it says, Now it is God who makes us and you stand firm in Christ. God gives us the strength to stand. But he also enables us to stand on a sure foundation. Houses crumble because their foundations are bad. 
Skyscrapers can't stand if their foundations aren't firmly anchored deep into the ground. When we stand, it needs to be on the rock of Jesus or we have no hope of standing firm. We need to be basing every single decision we make on God's word. We're standing on God's word. That is our foundation. Paul wrote about those who were preaching heresy. They promoted things that were actually opposed to the word of God. And he tells Timothy there's only one true foundation. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, But God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone. The truth does not change. It will never change. It's the foundation on which we stand. This is the command. We are commanded to stand. That's the first thing Paul commands us to do. And then he goes on to tell us about the enemy. In verse 11 and 12, he tells us that we are to stand against the devil's schemes. And he tells us that our struggle is not with men, but it's against nothing less than Satan himself and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Many followers of Jesus get nervous when we speak about this. But scripture clearly tells us that Satan is a being. He's set against God and he's set against the followers of God and those who serve God. When we look at the enemy, we need to understand Satan is real. He exists and he's active in trying to defeat Christians. Sometimes we can tend to blame Satan for everything. The devil made me do it. But I want to tell you, we're capable of, on our own of making poor choices and sinning on our own. Satan is active, but he's not going to be attacking those who are living in sin all by themselves. He will, however, attack those who are following after God with all of their hearts. First Peter 5 verse 8 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Now, when we leave areas in our lives open, we leave ourselves vulnerable to Satan's plans. When we don't deal with sin and we just try and ignore it, Satan will try and find a way in and attack. Too many Christians don't deal with sin in their lives. And that gives Satan an access point to launch an attack on you. If you don't get rid of sin, if you don't confess this and repent of it and turn away from it, it becomes a foothold that the devil needs to defeat us. That's why Ephesians chapter 4 verse 27 says, And do not give the devil a foothold. We need to deal with sin. We've got to be careful how we live our lives and the things we allow into our lives. Satan's an enemy and he wants to defeat the followers of Jesus. He is real. But I want you to clearly understand he is not God. Far too many people have credit much more power to Satan that is due to him. Satan is a powerful enemy and we cannot fight him on our own. But he is not God. He's not sovereign. He's not omnipotent, omniscient and omnipresent. But our God is. When we stand in God's strength, we will see victory over the enemy in our lives. When Satan attacks, we're not powerless. He can be resisted and he can be defeated. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Resist him, that's Satan, standing firm in faith, because you know that your brothers and sisters throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. James 4, verse 7 says to us, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. When we stand strong and resist the attacks and temptations of Satan, God will give us the victory. God is strong. We know that we have an enemy that is real. We understand that he's powerful. But we need to know most importantly that greater is he that is in you and me than he that is in the world. We're commanded to stand. We know our enemy and we have the armor of God in addition to this to enable us to fight the battles that we enter into. Now I want to say that the armor of God are not just pieces that we put on, things that we do. It relates to us and who we are. Paul tells us twice in these verses to put on the full armor of God. 
Each piece of armor has its purpose. Each piece is vital for us to be able to stand in this battle. As much as the armor is about you and me, it is also about the way we serve God, who we are and what we do. We need to apply this armor to our lives. So everything about the armor has to do with who we are. Who we are needs to reflect Christ. Jesus is the truth. Our lives need to reflect that. We are to live lives of integrity. We read in the scripture that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We live in a world that is uncomfortable with that. The world won't accept absolute truth. Everything is relative in the world. People prefer to define their own truth, and they try and change the sta their standards and the standards of the world. When we become followers of Jesus Christ, it is God who begins to change who we are. Our lives are now based on his truth alone. Putting on the armor, specifically the belt of truth, means that we're living a life where our inside beliefs are reflected in our outer actions. It's a life of integrity, understanding who we are in Christ. But wearing the armor also involves not only understanding who we are in Christ, but what we do. The armor is reflected in what we do. The breastplate of righteousness is living right and making right choices. The armor guards our hearts. We are to make wise decisions, wise choices that reflect who we are and what Christ has done for us. You know, if we're struggling in areas of our lives, we need to make choices to allow God to work in those areas. We need to make conscious choices in order to allow Satan not to get a foothold in our lives. Don't expose yourselves to things that you struggle with. Stay away from them. The Bible exhorts us to flee from temptation. Don't go to places where you're going to be tempted. Watch what yourself on the internet. Don't go to sites that are going to tempt you to sin. Ask for help. We need to understand in what we do, Christ has come to free us from the bonds of sin. So we need to deal with that sin. We've got to choose to live right. Understanding that our actions don't earn us our salvation. We are made right before God, righteous in His sight, because of what Christ did for us on the cross. Not because of anything we can do. But our gratitude needs to be shown in what we choose to do, do and how we choose to live our lives. Wearing the armor of God involves who we are, it involves what we do, and it also involves what we believe. When we believe that God is all He says He is, and He will do all He promises to do, that renders Satan powerless in our lives. This is the shield of faith. Believing the promises of God. Remember, we said it forms all those layers of the shield. And when Satan hurls his dart at us, we're able to stand. When Satan brings up guilt over past sins, we're able to stand on God's word that says we're freed and forgiven. When Satan tells us we're not good enough for God and God can't possibly love us, we can rest in the promise that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. When the doubts of arrows the arrows of doubt and fear come, we can know that we are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. God's truth will extinguish every lie of Satan. God's word gives us everything we need to stand. When we're standing and ready to flight, Christ is reflected in who we are, in what we do, and in what we believe. And then Paul goes on and tells us what empowers this armor. And he says the power behind the armor is prayer. The power comes from God through prayer. Communication is vital in any war. We have to be plugged into the source of God's strength if we're going to stand. We have to be communicating with God regularly and receiving our marching orders from him. That's why in verse 18 it says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. 
We need to pray at all times and in all ways. When we pray, we're going to see God bring in victory and we're going to see God's kingdom growing. And as I close this morning, I want to probably mention what I see as the most important point today. The command is to stand. Christ has won the battle and God has given us everything we need to be, be, be victorious. He also enables us to grow in Him. But God doesn't only want us to grow in Him. He wants us to impact the lives of others. The spiritual warfare is not just about me and centered all on me and I. It's about others. The battles that we go into are for the hearts and minds and ultimately the souls of men and women. Victory in the spiritual realm often relates to someone who is lost and then finds a living, vital relationship in Jesus Christ. The battles are all about the victories that God gives us, but also about winning men and women to Jesus Christ. We're told, go and make disciples. And we need to live in such a way that others are drawn to Jesus. This is what God wants, and that's what Satan keeps fighting to stop from happening. The goal is to stand, yes. But we don't stand to impress God. We stand so that people can see what a changed life looks like. So that men and women around us can see what a life looks like that is based on the unchanging word of God. We stand so that when others are falling, they will see that in God we have our strength and we can help them to find Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Paul emphasizes this truth in verse 19, how it's not just about me. He says in verse 19, Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might also declare it fearlessly, as I should. Paul is in prison here. He's in difficult circumstances. He's been beaten. He's been shipwrecked. And it's all because of the gospel of Jesus. Friends have left him. The Jews have snubbed him. And despite all this, Paul doesn't ask us to pray for his circumstances. But he asks us to pray that when he talks to others, his words will impact them. And God will change their hearts and their lives through him. Paul is focused here on winning men and women for Jesus Christ. This is what he is living for. This is what he's giving his life for. And he's saying, I'm, I'm fighting these battles, but I'm fighting for the souls of men and women that they might find life in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I want to challenge you. Stand up. Put on the armor of God. Live the life that God has created you to live. Leave your mark on this world by investing in others. Do the work that God has called you to do. Touch the lives that God wants you to touch. Speak to the people that God wants you to impact and share about Jesus. Don't get caught up in the daily demands of life where it's all about me and my worries in life. Because that's when we miss out on the wonderful opportunities God gives us to share his grace and peace with those who have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Make a difference in the lives of others. Whose eternity are you going to use? Will God use you to change? I want to challenge you this morning. Stand. Put on the armor of God. Be empowered by prayer and win souls for Jesus Christ because that's what he's destined us to do. The Lord richly bless you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we come this morning around the table of communion and we read from John 17, um, verse 3. It says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, 
the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And so as we come around the table of communion, we remember what it is that Christ has done for us and how his body was broken for us and his blood was poured out for us uh, so that we might have life and life eternal. And so this morning, as we look at this scripture, we're just reminded again that yes, eternal life is something that we will experience for eternity, but eternal life is something that starts today in knowing the Father, in knowing Christ, in being in relationship with them. And so as we partake of the emblems this morning, let us rejoice in our hearts, remembering that the relationship between us and the Father has been completely restored through the sacrifice of Christ. And so we may partake with joyful hearts. We can rejoice knowing that we have life eternal and ex we can experience it today already. And so let us just pray together as we come around the table of communion. Father God, we come before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, just for uh, this, this ability to come and celebrate communion together this morning. And so, Father, help us just to remember the true sacrifice of Christ. Help us to remember, Lord, what a great um, sacrifice it was for him to lay down his life. And so, Lord, may we respond with true thankful hearts. Lord, help us, Lord, to rejoice in this moment. Uh, knowing what we have received in Christ, knowing that He is alive, knowing that He is living, knowing that He is ever-present uh, in and throughout our lives. And so, Father, we just thank You, Lord, uh, that we can participate uh, in communion this morning, we can celebrate this together. And so, may we just remember uh, with thankful hearts what You have done for us. And so, Lord, we just come before You now, in Jesus' name. Let us participate in communion together.